I don't think it would surprise you know either of us to know that like uh, governments or, or companies will use like international law or whatever to like dick each other over for you know uh, 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 profits or competitive advantage or whatever. Of course. But I just know like uh, Noam Chomsky or um, you know other uh, Michael Parenti, I guess maybe like other leftists that talk about the problems with uh, you know WTO and uh, and GATT and stuff. Mm -hmm. is that it, it seems to override people's uh you know ability to to self-direct their government regarding like environmental protections worker protections things like that yeah it could that's I, the only problem i don't like is that that's just one analysis of it hello <laughs> hello can you hear me hey yeah i can hear you shit sorry i'm on my phone so i'm trying to fucking pause everything and stuff oh yeah no problem all right, so you were um, on a uh, stream a while back, and you were having a discussion on, uh, you know, all the rioting and, and whatnot, and then the destruction of property and the justification of it and stuff was obviously, like, a big part of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I agree, for the most part, with you on that um, basically any political-type action you're going to do you need to have some sort of like public support or that it's going to like push your message forward. So if whatever political action you're doing is hurting your message, it's probably like fucking dumb and you shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the other side of it. I guess the part that I'm kind of more interested in is the justification thing. Because at first what you kept saying was that the um, destruction of public property, police cars, police stations or whatever is justified, but destruction of private property is never justified. Mm -hmm. But then and then you were in a panel and people in the panel were like, oh, well, if uh, someone comes and torches your business, you can respond violently to them. So if so if Walmart comes in and destroys your business, uh, could you respond violently to them? And you said no, because that's like basically how our economy works. You know, Walmart is allowed to go into an area and start a business, even if that destroys other businesses. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's like how the economy. So that's fine. But then uh, later you said, um, if a company is like polluting someone's water or something and maybe they've gone through the proper channels of doing like a petition and trying to like do proper uh, address of grievances, then maybe political uh, sort of violence against that private property would be justified, right? Potentially, yeah. Okay, so I've divided this into two categories and I guess I kind of wanted to just pick your brain about it. So I have, um, if you funded it, then your destruction of it is justified. Like that goes for police stations and stuff. And then, uh, or it's retaliatory, retaliatory. So if, you know, they struck first, then uh, violence against, you know, the property is justified, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. You follow? Okay. Yeah. So uh, if political violence against a police station is justified, what about a prison? Mm, I mean, I guess it could be. I guess my view on like public property is that like it's publicly funded by everybody and it ought to represent everybody. So I could understand like publicly like destroying or i could understand destroying like public property insofar as that for like a protest of like a failure of the state so i mean i guess you yeah, could for like a prison that. yeah i mean it, depending on like are you like talking about like freeing a bunch of criminals and stuff like or you uh, saying, i don't know i'm thinking like uh like uh, uh attica and you know prison industrial complex you know maybe being against the you know, war on drugs and stuff uh if uh prisons are publicly funded and destruction of publicly funded property is justifiable if that mm -hmm. includes prisons as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't opinion. really see why not, unless there's some weird, like, if you're talking about, like, freeing a bunch of, like, axe murderers or something, it probably wouldn't be good for society. <laughs> but in terms of, yeah, I guess, yeah, I don't know why prisons wouldn't fall under the same, if police stations would, yeah. I don't, uh, I don't know what stats you would find where our prisons are full of axe murderers, but, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Well, what about private prisons, then? You know, like a CCA? Um... Yeah, for a private prison, I could if you if this is like specifically within the realm of what you are protesting, then maybe yeah. I I guess because mm -hmm. like I'm sure you can see what I'm getting at is like where in the sort of spectrum from you know strictly uh, private property like you know a a Walmart or a Target or whatever versus like a police station. Where on that on that spectrum is the is the political destruction of property justified? Well, I mean, I think, right. I, yeah, I don't think that's hazy at all. So, like, if you're, like, protesting, like, the police, like, the, the, the police government 
establishment, like if this is something that you're against, the, the criminal justice system in general, then private people that have an active hand in that, I could also see the, their properties being protested for sure. So for instance, if you were protesting the military industrial complex, I could see you protesting like Boeing or Lockheed, even though these are private corporations for sure. But I, that's still like pretty far removed from Walmart that doesn't have a direct hand in any of that, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Um, are you familiar with um, like the Plowshares? It was like a political group that, um, you know, attacked like uh, nuclear silos. Um, I'm not. In the US. But what about it? I just, I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Oh, you yeah, know, I'm, um, I'm not familiar with it. So if you're going to use it to make a point, you'd have to tell me about it first. Uh, um, nah, nah, not really. Let's jump off of that. Uh, um, okay, so if uh, political violence against a police station is justified, uh, what about companies with massive state uh, funding like? I guess like a Walmart or something where they have like a, or or uh, the Amazon buildings here in, in the West Coast. You know, no, I think I think once you start getting into like public subsidies, I think we get I think it gets a little bit weirder. I think that I, I feel I guess maybe it's arbitrary, but I feel it's too far removed at that point because of that because if you accept that, like if you're getting like public funding or public subsidies at that point, then you could theoretically go and blow up the house of anybody that is on like um like it's an earned income tax credit because they're getting a lot of money back from the government. I, I think at that point, I think you're a little bit too far removed. Yeah, that'd be pretty fucked up. I suppose that's true. Um, or anybody like cool. on food stamps uh, or EBT or something, yeah. Or all of a sudden, like, public property that you can go and destroy. Um, uh, should, should we jump from that one to the retaliatory subject, then? Yeah, go for it. All right, so... Um, if political violence against a company that pollutes the water is uh, justified, what about things like... Um, what Earth Liberation Front did, where they were like burning down housing developments that were uh, engaging in deforestation. Um, are you talking about? Are we talking about like eco terrorism in general? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, if uh, I mean, if, I can if see if the Flint people. Mm -hmm. If the Flint people are maybe justified, like I'm pretty sure if I looked into it, the people in Flint like have gone through the proper channels with petitions or whatever, and their water's still poisoned. If mm -hmm. they might be justified in doing uh, uh, violence against destruction of property then what about yeah in the case of like you know, terrorism mm -hmm. yeah I, I think that that's it's a it's a much harder one because the damages and harms of environmental stuff are is so much harder to quantify and see uh, but if i were to grant you if i were to grant you a lot of like let's say for instance we know for a fact that environmental harms are being done we know for a fact that it's quantifiable we know for a fact that people are being harmed then i mean i think you could justify morally some sort of response even i wouldn't probably be in favor of it for political effectiveness but i but i could see like a moral justification there for sure so like if i were to grant you like um we know for a fact that irreparable harm will be done to the planet by 2025 we know for a fact that certain groups of people are more likely to be impacted by others we know for a fact that certain corporations contribute to it then i could i could i could see moral justifications for like certain groups to enact you know protests or violent protests against these entities yeah i could see that okay um one, one that i think is going to come up uh, more and more and i guess it's kind of tricky is like automation uh, automating people out of a job i mean that's like the classic uh the saboteur you know throwing the wrench into the gears and stuff of the factory or whatnot mm -hmm. Um, but I, I don't know how much I would like justify that because I feel like a lot of times that's a societal good to get people out of these jobs that are uh, dangerous, you know, or demeaning or whatever and have that shit automated is, you know, societally a good thing, but I can see how an individual might have justified, uh, you know, to destroy that automation. Um, when it, I guess when it comes to like, hmm. So you're talking about like a person going to attack like a factory that's replaced his job or whatever? Yeah, like uh, an example I will give, uh, when I used to work um, fast food, they put in like this kiosk that you can order on. Yeah, and they said they weren't going to cut anyone anyone's hours and then they cut everyone's hours like immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and when the machine was uh, open so they could count the money, if you tampered with the screen, like it couldn't be opened again for a couple hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever, whatever chance I would get, I would always tamper with the screen because I was very irritated uh, <laughs> with that machine being there uh, as far as trying to get hours at a shitty job goes. Um, I mean, I would say that an employee probably doesn't have the right to do that. I don't think that... Um... At least in the United States, you're not guaranteed a job from any private company. There, there, that kind of guarantee doesn't exist. So you don't have a right to act as though you are guaranteed. One would be what I would, my, my I think my stance on that. I'd have to be moved off of that. 
Okay. I suppose, like, my stance is probably coming from the sort of, uh, whatever Kropotkin Marxist, like, uh, oh, all, um, production is, you know, pr produced socially and then expropriated privately or whatever, blah, 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 all that shit. Mm -hmm. Um, cool. Uh, I guess that was it. I was just, I was curious because it seemed like your position, you know, slowly got either slowly changed or just slowly got more nuanced, like through that series of, of videos I saw you discussing it. So I was wondering, uh, you know, if I could ask more uh, interesting questions than just, duh, but what if Walmart destroyed like the local hardware store? I, I felt like there was more interesting ways to address this uh, situation. So hopefully I've done that. Yeah, I mean, I think all of it, I mean, I, I think that the topic is very complicated. Um, and once you start to get to like more layers of removal or abstraction, like where responsibility ultimately lies with something is a pretty difficult question to um, to answer. Like like 9-11, I think, is an interesting question where it's like, did the American population deserve this? Well, I don't think the civilians did. Maybe if it was a military target, maybe that'd be better. Well, sure, but civilians are the ones that vote those policies in place. Well, we didn't really have a choice. Everybody's for the military industrial complex. Well, is that just because citizens don't put in a pressure on the government? Like that, that, like these are all like really complicated and hard questions to answer. I'm usually in favor of like some level of responsibility, but ultimate responsibility is really hard. Like, I don't think that a drone strike killing somebody in Yemen, I don't think that makes every single individual citizen of a country a murderer for doing that, but there's got to be some level of responsibility. I just don't know how you would, yeah, figure it. Yeah. Are you familiar with um, Ward Churchill, the author Ward Churchill? Um, no, I'm not. Hit me up. He was uh, he was the the first one I I think that that I know of to get popular off of saying America deserved 9/11. He was mm -hmm. on uh, Fox News and everything because of it. But um, he said, and it's it is an interesting thing to grapple with. He said that uh, you know if uh, 20 guys with you know, five dollars worth of box cutters did more, you know, damage to the the sort of system of global empire than like any anti-war protest ever did. Sure. <laughs> it's like kind of a, a scary calculation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. But fuck, I don't know. Um, I think this this is like maybe a little bit off, off topic, but I think like when it comes to protests and marches and stuff, it's like it, there. I don't really know how effective. Uh, they are the uh, the Saul Holinsky guy that wrote Rules for Radicals says like, um, you know, when they build a factory and it has a room, you know, designated to do sit-ins, you, you can't do sit-ins anymore. It's like the, you know, the system or whatever has has metabolized, you know, that that oh, course of action, right? There is actually, I can think of the best example of this. How old are you? Or I, that's not relevant, actually. Did you ever have something in high school called Senior Skip Day? Yeah, yes. Yeah, I don't know if your school did this, but I, I went to, so in my, in my high school, they had an official senior skip day if your grades were high enough, right? So if your grades were high enough, you were allowed to stay home that day. But that's not really senior skip day anymore, right? Yeah, no, it's not. Yeah, it's like, yeah, so it's, it's the same funny. kind of concept. I understand what you mean, yeah. Like if you have like an official sit-in area, well, they've obviously, they've put you somewhere where you're not going to disrupt anything, where no one's going to see your care. And it's like, well, the whole point of like a fucking sit-in or whatever is destroyed when you like, when you when you take this and make it a part of this, the machine, right? Like what the fuck is the point, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think I, I agree with sort of his prognosis. Like one of, one of the, uh, the tactics that he talks about in the book is they were... Uh, protesting something about an airline. I don't know if it was like the airline uh, employees or whatever they were doing a protest. Mm -hmm. And so what they decided to do is they went and sat in the um, bathrooms and they knew that all the, the wealthy sort of clientele that are like flying, you know, doing business, uh, flying airplanes all the time are gonna get off the airplane mm -hmm. and like to use the bathroom and then it's blocked and airports in the middle of nowhere. There's not like bathrooms easy to get to. And so, you know, instantly the owners of the airport were like, what do you want? What can we do? What can we do to make this go away? which is like much more effective than if they'd been, you know, marching with picket signs in front of the airport for like months or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I, I think for, for political effectiveness, really, it's like we kind of need to, uh, you know, branch out and be more creative than just, just marching or whatever. But if, uh, if marching with signs is going to be the, the way that we engage politically, whether it's like Black Lives Matter or whatever, uh, uh, if that's going to be the the tactic that's used, then I agree with what uh, Slavoj Žižek said about it, which is like, if you just march, then no one's going to care about it. We've all seen marches. It's boring. No one gives a shit. If you just break windows, it's scary. It looks bad. No one wants to join because they don't want to get hurt and just looks terrible. So what you need to do is you need to break 
some windows and then disavow that window break. You know, enough to like be shocking and get the attention of the news and the general public, but then, you know, disavow that and point to like, well, look at all these marches that were peaceful, you know, 90 whatever percent of the BLM marches were peaceful and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, do you, do you ag agree? Do you feel like some, some level of like, uh, yeah, it's kind of like you have like the, the, the protest that you, one protest to reject and one protest to accept or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, like I've heard that idea. I don't know. I'm like, I've taken the big election pill recently where I honest to God, I think that a whole bunch of political problems in the United States could be solved if we made ma if voting mandatory. <laughs> That's where I'm at right now. Um, I view a lot of problems in America, like being, um, foundational on like the local level. And we have like almost 20% participation in local politics and it's heavily skewed towards a certain demographic. So I feel like that's, what's going to continue to be represented. So I think right now my biggest thing is just getting people out to vote. I think is like the hugest thing that we could possibly do. Um, and then we can start working on problems from there, but I don't believe that any meaningful change will ever be accomplished in our system. As long as it's, it's, as long as only a slim percentage of the population is voting and that percentage is selecting for affluent, wealthy, or I'm sorry, affluent middle-class white men yeah well we could do like what other countries did and like have a voting be an official holiday and automatic mm -hmm. registration and all that probably yep. the mail-in voting is going to be like a big they're like i don't understand why we can't have some sort of uh you know smartphone process either an app i guess uh, the voting machine stuff of the 2000s kind of at least tainted me to the idea of any kind of electronic voting but i feel like we're advanced enough like we could implement something like that potentially yeah, I mean, well, it, it still needs to be paper for a variety of reasons. There's a really good, um, is it Tom Scott, I think, um, has a really good video on why it has to be paper. It just, it has to be. It has, there has to be paper. Or it needs to be an electronic machine with paper ballots behind it. But, um, um, yeah, but I mean, like, if, if more people voted, I think different things would happen. But, well, I guess we'll see after this election, huh? Um, yeah, I agree. Cool. Um, I guess, I guess that's all I really had, um. It's nice to uh, officially talk to you. The most that we've kind of connected is that um, I set up your discussion with Michael Albert a while back, and I was trying to get your discussion with the uh, Howie Hawkins people set up, but they kind of backed out of that, which sucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thanks. I appreciate it, man. Um, I guess uh, shout out for me. I'm Radical Reviewer. I review books and stuff. Check it out. It's pretty cool, I guess. Um, appreciate you having me on. Yeah, no problem. If you, if, if you ever DM me on... Twitter? I don't know if that's possible. Or now, wait, well, hey, you have me on Discord. If you ever message me on Discord, we can always chat. If you just shoot me a message here or whatever, it's really easy to do. So, okay. Sounds good. All right, yeah, have a good one, buddy. I love you. Have fun. Wait, hold on. Whoa. Hey. Oh wait. Me hold on. Do you have a moment? Huh? The, do Doug wants to ask you a question. Be asked. I, I would. I would actually it. like to ask him a question. Um, uh, no, dogs can't grow mullets. What? Not that I know of. What? What? I'm I'm a dog. Can you see my YouTube channel? No. I am what? A dog. I'm so confused right now. This is Doug. D oh, Doug wants to ask a question. Yes, my name is Doug. Hi. Hello. I have an honest question, and it's, yeah, what's up? And at least glancing at your YouTube channel, it seems that you're at least claiming, with some relative proof, that you have read Marx and the various academic works of theory on the subject matter. Correct. You, you would you affirm that claim uh yeah i, I think so I, I there's definitely people out there um smarter than me but i like to try and uh you know build up on my skills and, and read this and that yeah okay do you read marks for strategic value of understanding the best way to accomplish your goals or do you read marks because you feel like his analysis of the sociological and economic issues of our modern state are accurate hmm um, I think probably more so the second one, but to be honest, like, I feel like even though, uh, uh, sort of a Marxist, you know, analysis or whatever has like a lot to teach us, I think there's a lot of other people like, um, you know, David Harvey, for example, that's like, you know, a, uh, more modern, um, you know, Marxist economic take on what's going on, or Michael Albert, who Destiny talked to, um, I feel like a lot of his critiques is maybe a little bit more apt in our kind of modern technological well, corporate capitalism, whatever. Well, if, if I recall Albert's lectures, and it's been a while, I believe his he still identifies as a Marxist, correct? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. So, I so I so if you're really gonna put your theory hats on in the audience, I'm sympathetic to the Blancus theory that dancing around political ideology is kind of worthless. Like, 
because Marxism is so toxic as an identity or political movement in America, we could argue if it's for accurate reasons or not. Is it not valuable to reject, like, basing your theories or claim to base your theories on Marx? Like, you could pick people like Piketty or Mark Blythe or Stiglitz have a fairly, um, in my opinion, accurate analysis, economic analysis of the powers of systems. And these aren't, like, know-nothing adjunct professors. Like, Joseph Stig Dr. Stiglitz won a Nobel Prize. Ah, yeah, I think I read one of uh, Stiglitz's books back in the day. I, I think there's a handful of reasons for why I sort of reject this idea. Maybe the biggest one being, like, popularity. Um, I think, like, the, the name Marx and, and Marxism is just more uh, readily acknowledgeable. And you can say, like, th that it's, you know, tainted by whatever sheds, like, I don't know, Stalin and well, so, uh, whatnot. So, like, but, uh, but, uh, there's a concept um, of marketing where, like, you can, and sure, you might be able to win over certain audience, but if you antagonize your audience too much, it's not worth it. Like, I'm sure uh, Twitch could market itself with a bunch of swastikas. Now, that would get, like, a solid 10% of the audience. That would not, probably lock down every neo-Nazi in America on the Twitch audience, but it would turn everyone else off. Yeah, Embracing yeah, yeah. Marxism, if you're purely trying to analyze, use Marxism as a material analysis tool, seems worthless. Because, sure, you might lock down every single person who, in history class in high school, said, you know, you could who wrote the paper justifying the massacre of the czars. Ours, yeah, like you that. might like, end up sure. with some uh, Bernie or Buster tanky dipshits, like, in, well, in tow. Uh, yeah. reg regardless of that, like, it doesn't seem worthwhile to me. And, like, I have sat down and read the text, the economic... Like, I think there's an interesting kind of... There's a small bit of, like, sociological analysis in Marx I find interesting in terms of, like, uh, uh, isolation. But I feel like, minus that, most of the analysis that you could find is easily uh, findable, if not more accurate, because it uses more up-to-date data. It's more data-driven. And further, it's more based on, like, anecdotal stories of modern sociology. Like... Piketty's Capital of the 21st Century was read by every, apparently, like every major billionaire who had a, who writes it publicly when it came out. Like, it had an appeal. Why still root your theories in Marx, in Engels? Like, why still tie it to that? Like, unless, you, like, it, like, if you're going to go full violent revolution, I guess there's a bend in my arm, I guess there's a theory to it. But what's the point? Why, why embrace the colors of a Marxist still? Um, so I guess I can take this in, you know, the three different directions. So I think well, it was like the bad. I'm asking, I'm asking the personal one. We can, let, we can argue strategically another day, but I'm asking the personal one. Um, I mean, I feel like I'm still going to go forward with this. Is how I've rationalized it to myself. So like, uh, you know, the reactionary alt-right type people, they're always changing their names because they're like dishonest about, uh, you know their goals whether they're uh, paleo conservatives or uh whatever whatever like whatever flavor they they call themselves where like you know our position is more about being honest about the the stance uh so that's one aspect of it i think like if you look at someone who's really into i don't know like john Locke or whatever it's like they always people tend to refer to like or, or Darwin or something like they they refer to the um, the mainstays of their uh, political stance. Is that I don't I don't follow. Like I, I, I most liberal democracies have rooted their at least some elements of their theory in John Locke. It's about uh, uh, if you're refer referencing social Darwinism, you could, but that's typically not a key pillar of the modern paleocon movement. Your reference the suggestion that, that I... like. Mm -hmm. If I went around saying like I'm a you know a Richard Wolfian or like a Michael Albertsian, like no one's gonna know what I'm talking about as much well, as if I were well, to say partially, well, partially nice, and I say it's with respect to Richard Wolf or Michael Albert. Um, they're not internationally well known names, and I'm not saying you should identify as like a Mark Blythist or something like that. But I do think there's value in recognizing that, for, like, marketing yourself as a Marxist doesn't add any market value to a brand your brand if your focus from a professional standpoint is economic redistribution equalization of power oh like um, fun fundamentally I think my like, other... mm -hmm. i'm sorry no go on go on no, like no, I'm, no. I'm just trying i i i've come around to steven's art perspective of just 
going one point at a time instead of trying to do the instead of both of us submitting like essay and answers to each other. So if your if your first point's going to be like trying to compare yourself to like the paleocons and their constant renaming, like that is true. But the I reason the conservative myself, movement of the modern myself. era has renamed itself multiple times is to make itself more effective politically speaking. Um, I, I think that my other reason would be that um, as more of these sort of uh, Cold War Democrats like, uh, uh, you know, die mm -hmm. off or, or, or fade from relevance or whatever, that a lot of the unjustified Cold War type uh, fears are kind of fading away. I mean, we saw that with Bernie Sanders and the word socialism, right? Sure, but Bernie lost. Yeah, and but... That's an issue. Um, Whoa, 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 further, 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 I would yeah. say, I, if, if it came down to the point suggested that Bernie would have won if he identified as a social mm -hmm. democrat instead of a democratic socialist, I would say Bernie Sanders is even more of a failure because, because of the stupid branding material, he decided that this was more important. Like, there are people who are joking in chat saying I'm a crypto communist, and that's not the point, though. Like, the, the entire point of the analysis is power distribution essentially like you can argue the theoreticals all you like but like if i was confident neoliberalism would result in a more egalitarian society with less people impoverished i would call myself a neoliberal i don't believe it neoliberalism is that powerful brand so i don't call myself a neoliberal to me so to meet someone who's who claims and it seems to have strong evidence that they've read all the all the classical marxist texts i i am asking you like again like how do you justify weakening the marketability of a movement in the name of like personal branding in this way um i don't know i i guess maybe i'll take the the sort of uh contrapoints stance where it's like uh, you know a lot of times i'll let the the label sort of shift according to the conversation so like i don't i don't typically go around calling my, myself a marxist or saying like the, the groups that i'm you know affiliated with are like uh Marxist or whatever. My stance is kind of I want to take everyone exactly where they are and just move them left. You know, um, so if I'm working like I used to work at a uh, um, homeless shelter, like the things that I'm trying to do there is like more left leaning. If I'm joining like a socialist alternative or the IWW or a socialist Rep association or whatever, my my membership there is about trying to move mm -hmm. things you know, to the left, um, but okay, uh, so, whatever you're gonna call. It. Okay, but like, I don't, I don't see, I don't see Marxism as uh, tied to because people will say like, um, you know, oh, if Marx is personally responsible for like eighty gazillion deaths, I'm, well, I'm not, isn't, I'm not arguing, you know, that, no, 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 I'm not theories. arguing that this, this isn't a, this isn't an academic discussion. This is purely okay. a political, a political viability discussion. Like this yes, is, yeah. we look at a poll, and even if we're being incredibly generous. Marxism or socialism in terms of the wider public or, or, like, or the electorate, mm -hmm. which is not just millennials taking a poll in by Vogue or something like that. That is okay. not popular. It's not super majority popular. Like, if you, like, for, for comparison, like, no, if you, if you ask people, are you a fascist, most people say no. But unfortunately, yeah, yeah, yeah. you suggest, should we kill migrants at the border? A, tra a, a scary amount of people are in favor of that. And that's what concerns me. I don't care if people identify as fascists or not. I I care and I'm concerned that there are a statistically significant amount of Americans that would be in favor of vi using violence to for immigrant for immigration issues. That's my concern. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess I would uh, I would go where the uh, where the numbers lie. I mean, I was. Um, I was a big supporter of, of Ralph Nader, and Ralph Nader has since come out that, like, you know, oh, he's glad, you know, Bernie Sanders ran on the main ticket, and, you know, the third party thing is maybe, you know, not the best strategy. And I feel like, yeah, if dropping a, a communist for socialist, or dropping socialist for social democrat, or, dem or vice versa, or whatever, um, I mean, I care about, I care about honesty and stuff, uh, obviously more so. I'm not trying to be, uh, crypto or something but i think yeah i mean if you you want to be marketable okay. i don't really see a problem with that but okay so i obviously this question's a bit these this conversation's a bit warped because we're because this is naturally a conversation about social branding 
this is partially why like i i decided purposely not to get involved in like internet media because i didn't want to have my political identity warped by a profit margin and i hope and i'm entering this conversation believing that you're you're going to keep your political opinions honest or your political policy ambitions honest on it so i i so no one challenge him so no i don't want anyone in chat challenging him to say like oh he's doing this for patreon money what i think is important though is well, I, I sat at uh, 300 subscribers for like four years I, i'm all right <laughs> it's mostly great. a hobby <laughs> okay great so but i just want to get that across uh, it's like obviously i'm sure you and i know and i'm sure steven knows i'm sure a lot of people in this audience know that there are people who have organized these political ideals for profiteering, but just because something's profitable on YouTube doesn't make it making an effective political ideology. Right. I, 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 so again, I push to you this, like why endorse, embrace, defend Marxism? Why make it the pillar of your political identity? Why just like, um, yeah, I, I re, like, like, Go ahead. Engaging with it necessarily it lose it causes you to lose effect. Maybe there's a theoretical future, but okay. Wait, hold on. Wait, can I? Okay, so wait. So Doug's Go question, for, please. yeah. So Doug's question is basically what he's asking: um, is what is your goal in your online existence? Like, what do you hope to achieve or effect at the end of the day? Is what he's asking. Um, I don't really know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, I, I often, I guess, kind of wonder my uh, my efficacy or, or, or my purpose, but I just know that um, I liked a lot of the stuff I read in college. I liked a lot of the stuff that I read after college. I noticed uh, like five or six years ago when I started on YouTube that mm -hmm. there was people reviewing, like Lindsay Ellis or whatever, reviewing movies in an interesting way. And I thought there should probably be somebody like reviewing these uh, political texts and stuff that could... Uh, either kind of make them more accessible or, or, or challenge them or discuss them in an interesting way. Yeah, I, mean, I think... I just like uh, thinking about stuff and, and learning and, uh, and growing and whatnot. I never expected... Uh, and if you look at some of my first videos, I obviously never expected them to be things that people were actually watching. It was kind of more of a personal project of... Mm -hmm. I, what, what it really started is I took a book off my bookshelf. It was like a Chomsky book. And I thought, oh, this sounds good. I'm going to read this. And I opened it and I'd already read it. It's like, yeah. Huh. Um, and so I, I thought, oh, I'll make this channel where I'll review videos so that I can, like, remember the things I read more easily. It can go back to them more easily, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I, I think all Doug is asking is, because Doug is trying to figure out, are you in this for, like, some, to, to be politically effective, or is it just a hobby? Because I think if it's just a hobby, then, yeah, do what you do or whatever. But I, I think what Doug is getting at, or what Doug's question is, is if you're trying to be politically effective, or to influence people, or to bring minds over to your camp, or to secure some sort of political power, it seems as though branding yourself a Marxist is alienating immediately to so many people that it'd be easier to kind of be a little bit less forthcoming about that Marxist and align with somebody like Piketty or whatever, somebody that's a little bit more modern, a little bit a little bit less contentious, and that you'd have an easier time kind of recruiting people to your side. But but the, but in order to get to that, that fundamental question is what is your goal in life? Because if your goal is just you think some stuff is cool and you want to talk about it, then it doesn't really matter. But if your goal is to be politically effective, Doug is questioning the the strategy by branding yourself a Marxist. I think is what Doug is getting at, right? Yeah, yeah and, okay, yeah, and that's, full credit, yeah. like, you're, you're better than a lot of people online because you do other things besides to be on the internet. But I'd push back and say even further, like, you ident like when you were talking about, like, stuff you do in person, person, like, you're focused on, like, moving people to the left. Left, oh, left, on the, and the question would be, like, well, how? And to left to what? Like, unfortunately, I don't think I'll be able to get my grandfather to ever be a socialist. Just... But yeah, but it sounds to me like labor rights it sounds to me like his goal is to maximize the amount of leftists he's creating, but more just like he thinks there's some cool writings and he wants to talk about them. And if as a byproduct of that, some people move left as a result, then he's like happy with that. But that's that's like a byproduct of what he does. It's not his like primary goal is to be like politically effective online or to start a movement of Marxists. Well, and and I ask this then why? Like of all the things to be po the, to build a profitable falling around, why Marxism? Like we can see the numbers like. Is like you're better off talking about Star Wars drama than Marxism. If you're doing well, he said he was at 300 topic. subscribers for a long time, so it doesn't sound like this is like a, his drive is to make this like a primary okay, job or a primary okay, source of income, okay, but rather okay, just like enough, something that's enough. entertaining. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like um, you can find people that will like go into like 25 hours of content of discussing whether or not Gogeta or Vegeta would win in a fight, and there's not much money to be made here, but it's just that's what some people's interests lie, right? I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Yeah, I'd say so. I, for for an example, like I could I could think of for trying to like move people left. As I remember, I, a discussion I had there was a, a person, uh, a, a coworker that was trying to get into journalism, and he was going to these like very first um, 
you know, alt-right Antifa clash uh, protests and he's asking me, you know, oh, what do you think is, do you think people should be punched for their, uh, for their opinions and stuff? Do you think like this is an attack on free speech? And I tried to sort of, um, you know, whatever, explain this um, idea that, you know, people's, uh, you know, words can, can have power and, and people should be responsible for their actions or whatever. And I, I don't know, maybe I moved him slightly off of the alt-right stuff if he was heading in that direction. I'd, I'd like to hope so. And just try and move people left from from wherever they are. Uh, as far as my my channel, yeah, it, it's mostly uh, a hobby. I like to plug it um, when I can. You know, I'll shoot uh, on Twitter or something. I'll shoot a review. I've done um, so. I recently reviewed Democracy at Work by Richard Wolf, and I shot that to him on uh, Twitter and stuff, and shared around on Reddit and whatnot. You know, but I don't think like I'm gonna start any activist group or like run for office or something off of like what I'm doing on YouTube. It's mostly just uh, information uh, spreading, allowing access to information a little more easily for people who don't have the time to read or the energy or don't have uh, maybe the academic talent for it or whatever you want to call it. Cool. I think I think I that's get, fair. That's a lot. Oh, that's a lot of what I do. Doug hates that, but that's what a lot of what I do too. My goal isn't necessarily to like convert. It. I don't <laughs> ah, it. you hate it. Um, I don't hate it. I just don't understand it. Okay. Like, it's that's all. It's like you're speaking to me in Spanish. It's like I get a I get the general concept of it, but it's a language I just don't speak. I, I, but hey, mm -hmm. if that's what makes you happy, I'm I'm sorry for existentially challenging what makes you happy. <laughs> that was not my intention. That's right. it, um, Des Destiny, speaking of you trying to, to do the same thing, I recently watched your um, video on um, Noam Chomsky and the GAT. Um, yeah, what about it? Um, so you were bringing up, like, there was a, a scenario where, um, you know, a company was in Canada, Canada was trying yeah, to screw over this. Yeah. Uh, um, the, the one that I'd heard, maybe it was in regards to asbestos or something, that the Canadian government was trying to like ban asbestos and a company in the US took them to the court and won and overturned their uh, asbestos ban. And then they were, and then the company was able to produce asbestos product or whatever, like in the US and Canada. And that was like a, a challenge to the government's ability to you know, protect their, their citizens uh, environmentally. That's yeah, maybe it just depends. Like when the left of people worry about that stuff. Yeah, it just you. It's a lot of this is like, a lot of it is very complicated. That's such a weasel. Uh, but I would have to see how a particular ban is phrased and what a, and what a particular ban is actually trying to accomplish. Because obviously, if somebody like if we look for instance, like is it Prop 16 or 22 in California, right? This is going to be phrased in the affirmative on both sides. On one end, we're protecting workers with the ability to earn as much money as they should to have living wages. But the other side is going to argue, well, they're protecting workers' rights to um, work as independent contractors and set their own hours, right? Everybody always speaks about the affirmative. Um, asbestos is a really complicated thing. I don't know if we still use it in, in the United States, but it is a very effective insulator. Um, but like, so here's, here's something that a lot of people don't know about asbestos, for instance. If you have asbestos sometimes in a household, um, I think generally the recommendation is actually not to remove it. It's usually just to seal it. And the reason why is because when you remove it, it's a very complicated, arduous process that requires biohazard suits. The dumping for it is incredibly complicated. There's a risk of contamination of the air when you disturb it. If you just seal it, usually you just ignore it, forget it, and it, you just like seal it, and that's it. That's how you deal. That's like the recommended way to deal with it. Um, so I don't know if somebody tries to, when they say if they want to ban asbestos, they're talking about the manufacturer, or are they saying we need to remove it from every area, which would be like prohibitively costly. Like it, it just, it, things can get really complicated when it comes to like, is this protecting the environment, or is it being done for political reasons, or to like damage? or destroy some business or whatever um, like th that, that's i would have to like know the more specifics about that like with that ethyl corp thing people were saying that canada wanted to ban mmt because it's harmful to the human body etc etc and that is true but the concentrations of MMT that were found in the air were like so many levels below even what the EPA's guidelines were that the idea that um, MMT found in gasoline, Ethyl Corp or Ethyl Corp, they made the argument that like this ban has nothing to do with health purposes. It'll never be in high enough concentrations to hurt humans. Um, like if, if we really thought that it was going to be harmful to humans in these trace amounts, we would ban like all of agriculture because of trace amounts of arsenic being found coming off of livestock or, or crops or something. Like, that was a lot. Sorry. But yeah, like you, you have to get into the minutia for a lot of these policy bans to figure out like are they being done for environmental reasons or for political reasons and, and should they be upheld or not yeah yeah i mean I don't, I don't think it would surprise you know either of us to know that like 
uh, governments or, or companies will use like international law or whatever to like dick each other over for, you know, uh, 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 profits or competitive advantage or whatever. Of course. But I just know like uh, Noam Chomsky or, um, you know, other uh, Michael Parenti, I guess, maybe like other leftists that talk about the problems with, uh, you know, WTO and, uh, and GATT and stuff. Mm -hmm. is that it, it seems to override people's uh you know ability to to self-direct their government regarding like environmental protections worker protections things like that yeah it could that's I, the only problem i don't like is that that's just one analysis of it like in one end it could be used to obscure um, people's abilities to negotiate with their government what these worker rights and protections should be. On the other end, so for instance, for the TPP, there was like a lot of access into that with like labor councils and whatnot, a, a part of the federal government that had a lot of input into what the worker rights should be. If we look at a place like Vietnam, what does the average worker in the United States have a say in how like Vietnamese workers are treated? Like our, our say is like pretty low. I guess maybe you could not buy products from Vietnam, but figuring that is figuring out, you know, where your products come from can be a very complicated process. But with multilateral trade agreements, well, now we actually have direct input over it. If you want to be part of this multilateral trade agreement, these are the labor standards by which you have to fall under. And if you don't, then we're not going to trade with you or you're not going to be part of this agreement. So in some ways, in some ways you do have the ability to influence that. Um, yeah, I, I just I think it's good to look at both sides. There. I don't like the idea of like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I would never trust a corporation to, to fucking have the people's best interests in, in mind. I'm not a, I'm not a corporate shill like that. That would be dumb as fuck. A corporation's job is to make money at the end of the day. And that's all the fuck they care about. One hundred percent. But there are like positives to that. and There are negatives to that. And I think it's worth it to acknowledge both sides rather than to just say that we need to throw all of this shit out because there might be some potential downside. Like, let's limit the downsides and continue to enjoy the upsides is usually what I say. Yeah, for sure. I, I could get on board with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I guess while, while I have you here, the, the other thing I'd like to say, I know you're probably um, super busy with election stuff or whatever else you have on your plate, but you should do a uh, Michael Albert discussion part two at some point, <laughs> I think. Man, par dude, participatory economics seems like one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my time. I'm not going to lie, man. That's some crazy fucking shit that is like so out there theoretically. Like... It's like I, it's I, fun I think to think about, but like, damn. I I agree. It's kind of sus. I but. think that one of the things, and it might just be that um, Michael Albert is maybe too old to update uh, his theory to like our our modern time. But I feel like a lot of the um, oh, making you know everyone's going to make this plan for what they're going to have for the next six months or whatever. I feel like a lot of that could just be uh, done with algorithms and stuff. You know, you set up order. You know, you, the way that Amazon like tracks people's orders and stuff, but do it in, in such a way that you're um, running a planned economy through that almost, right? Yeah. A democratically um, planned economy. Like, may, so, a, uh, ju so just for people that, kind of yeah, so just for people that don't know in terms of what we're talking about. So participatory economics is the idea that every single person at every single job would be working, would be like shifting like would be like switching what they do as a job like every six months that every single person would have equal input on almost every single area and there would be like a rotating schedule where the managers would work in the production and the producers would work in different parts so that everybody would switch their jobs around so that everybody has input into all parts of a job at a large company whatever. It, like th this is what we're talking about um even if you used a computer to manage this like i don't know man i think specialization of labor has, has given us some big benefits <laughs> I, it just sounds it's like such an out there thing that like it's so hard for me to even envision like i have nothing to compare this to like i I have no examples, no empirical foundation. Like, I, I think that the uh, the uh, book publishing company that Michael Albert worked for like ran things in that way. In my review of the book on um, on my my channel, I discussed that the the homeless shelter I worked at, in a way, I mean, obviously there was like uh, directors and stuff, so it was more of your standard organization. But every day, all of the employees come in. We sit down, we have like a meeting about how the day is going to go. We discuss what we want. We divide up, you know, okay, who wants to do the dishes? Who wants to give out the food? Who wants to uh, um, do this or that that position, hand out the, the blankets and stuff? And then at the end of the day, we come back again. Okay, how did today go? Anything of note? Should we, you know, write anything down for the people tomorrow? And it was, I mean, things functioned well. It was a lot better than... I'd be interested you know, in seeing know, that same thing happen in like a factory. Um... Yeah.
But I, maybe, I don't know. I, I'd be interested. In, like, I, I'm not, listen, I'm not married to any idea. I'm not married to fucking capitals or anything, right? Like, if another, like, at right. the end of the day, I just want as many people to be as happy and healthy as possible. If fucking socialism or anarcho-communism or whatever fucking shit achieves that, then fuck capitalism. I would switch that in an instant. I mean, like, this is why I'm always in favor of, like, small-scale experiments with, like, worker cooperatives or, or stuff like that. Like, if somebody wanted to try out participatory economics as a way to organize, you know, some particular company, and we found out at the end of the day that that process was actually, like, incredibly fucking beneficial, that... Maybe managers could manage workers way more efficiently if they had hands-on experience with the job, or maybe workers could work better if they knew from the top down what things look like. Yeah, I think it'd be really interesting. I'd be more in favor. I just, I would just need more like hands-on like data, I guess, with something like that. So, so firstly, ideally, I would like tend to totally agree with you, but I feel like we could agree that like say under um, chattel slavery or something to say like, well, hey, maybe one of these farms should try paying the slaves and see how that works. Like they would just be out competed by like the, the grander society around them easily. Well, I don't know. I mean, like this is something that I kind of fundamentally disagree with. I think that this is given as an example a lot, but I think that history doesn't, I don't think actually support this, this narrative. So for instance, there's two ways that I hear this. So, um, one is in your slavery example. I think that the North largely had moved on from a lot of like slave labor e economically, and it actually benefited them to do so. Like, I don't think the North got rid of slavery at great economic cost. I think that like freeing slaves, making black people part of your like economy and giving them jobs and, and educating them liter literary stuff and all but, of that. But I, did that happen with a few small experiments like what you're suggesting, or did it happen like as a, as a larger trend? I, I think it usually happens as part of a few small experiments, but um, I guess I don't know 100% specifically. I do know that when people make the arguments for it, capitalism, that capitalism wasn't declared like new economy of the world, we're all going to be capitalists, but rather there were yeah, all of these sure. small scale trades that were happening on these local levels. And eventually like people saw like, well, organizing things this way is like a really effective means of doing this. And then it, ca it caught on and then eventually it like exploded into like the larger mainstream, but only after it had sh worked on like smaller levels first, there was no like global declaration saying we are now all capitalists. It did work on a smaller scale. So I, that's one of the things I push back on, on socialists when they say like, oh, we need to have a global revolution for socialism. It's like, well, if you can't even demonstrated working effectively on a smaller scale, it seems hard to believe that some global decree could make it work on a larger scale. Yeah, for sure. Um, shit, there was one other thing I had in, that off of something else you said. Now I can't remember. Mm -hmm. yeah. Damn it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I talk a lot. You can always interrupt me if you want. Or usually what I do when I talk to people is I write things down on a notepad so that I don't forget if they're talking because I know I'll forget. Just conversational things I do. <laughs> Sorry. No, for sure. I'm, I'm outside playing fetch, so I'm just like, I don't have a... Oh, sure. <sighs> um, shit. Um, that, that, that's all I got, I guess. I, I can't remember what the fuck I was going to say. Okay. Um, we were talking about... We'd said, um, oh, 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 I remember now, specialization. You were talking about specialization. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, you would admit that, like, um, let's see, you had, like, a job at a, at a casino, right? Like, you were a restaurant manager or something? Yeah, basically, yeah. Okay, so, like, there's a handful of tasks that take place at the casino, like making the, the schedule, making the, the food, uh, bus, uh, busing tables or whatever, right? Mm hmm uh, the idea isn't that it's like everyone is learning like all the most complex tasks, but just that there's enough of those tasks like busing a table or cleaning the bathroom or something mm -hmm. that only takes like a day to learn. And so um, if we share around the stuff that only takes like a day to learn, then we can also share around like the more complex stuff that's a little more interesting to do. <sighs> I mean, you know, like, like, I understand uh, that, but the, pr so, like, this is, this might be my classism, capitalism speaking or something. Not everybody that works that can be, like, a supervisor or manager. Just, like, they're just not, some people just don't have it. Uh, maybe they could be trained for it, but some people either lack the authoritative, like, demeanor. Um, some people don't know how to delegate responsibilities efficiently. Um, some people lack the, the, the structure or organizational skills. To, to schedule people or to do orders. Um, not to say that people couldn't learn. I think any, I don't think managers have like a special DNA brain to, to manage, but like it would be, it would require so much training for so many different people. And God damn, if you lost an employee that you trained across like 15 different jobs, that's so much of an investment. Like, holy fuck. Like, I don't know. It just seems like a relatively inefficient way to organize a business. Like you're going to be spending so much more on training. 
And at some point, I think you're gonna have people that excel in some jobs. Some people are really good at, at cooking. Some people are really good at supervising. Some people are really bad at, um, you know, like going out and busting tables or talking to customers. Like, um, I mean, uh, you know, uh, folks at home or whatever, if you have Google, if you just Google image uh, balance job complex, it kind of brings up like some examples. And it's not like these people have to learn like 10 or 20 tasks, but just that, you know, they, they share in some of the, uh, I think the, the picture that I've seen is like, there's like a fireman and like a nurse or something and it's showing like, okay, if he's spending, you know, this, this many hours doing the most interesting part of the job, he's gonna spend like uh, this many hours doing these other two tasks, like like sweeping up at the fire station or whatever. It's yeah, I like guess- he's learning 30 things. No, yeah, I understand. I guess, but like if I had to choose between like a like a, like, I don't know if I would want a doctor that spent half his time training to also be like, you know, like a janitor or like somebody that valets out in the parking lot. Like, I think I'd want somebody that had, like dedicated a good deal of time to just learning like the doctor stuff. Yeah, but why would he spend half half his time learning to like clean bedpans? Wouldn't he spend like one afternoon of his life learning to clean bedpans and like all the other time would be the regular time he spent learning brain surgery or whatever? Well, but I mean, I imagine he's going to spend some time working those jobs as well, right? Yeah. Also, we have to look at the flip side too. Like, does this mean that janitors are going to be practicing medicine? Um, I mean, if they if they want to, I don't. I don't necessarily think about it that way. I think about it like um, if we have a lot more access to uh, education and stuff, the people who maybe would want to do that and were otherwise priced out of it are able to. So I don't think of it like janitors will be doing brain surgery. I think about it like brain surgeons will sometimes take out the garbage because it's easy to do and it's easy to learn how to do that yeah i guess it yeah i may i would have to i would have to sit down and radically reorganize my brain it was it did chomsky was he the one that said sometimes it's easier to imagine the world ending than moving away from capitalism i think that was zizek but yeah oh it might have been zizek yeah um yeah so yeah okay yeah so i mean i might be just stuck really hard I'm readily admitting that I might be stuck really hard in a capitalist framework when I think of these things. But like, if I have somebody that's invested all that money into going to school, or even invested all that time into going to school to become a neurosurgeon, when I have them in my hospital, I don't want them to waste their time doing tasks that can be delegated to 99% of the population when they've educated themselves to become 1% of the population capable of performing such tasks. Like I'd want them to maximize, or it's even I think about it my, myself as a business person myself, right? I don't want to spend half my time editing and uploading YouTube videos. I can pay a lot of different people to do that. Only one person can stream as destiny, right? That's what I specialize in. So that's what I want yeah. to do, yeah. If I may, the the criticism of participatory economics that I've always found very powerful was it's not an economic theory. It's a moral theory that's been forced into like Marxism. It's a sense of like, if we make the doctors be more humble, that's how we'll achieve quote unquote socialist utopia. If we, if we like enforce humility. Well, so like I would, so I would view it as an economic theory. Um, but the, the, the thing is, is that we have to exercise some level of morality when we choose which theories we want to go with, basically. Um, but well, the, there's, a, there's a really easy way to create the world you're talking about without having to do this whole, like, mythologizing of socialism. It's called having a tight labor market. Like, if the labor market's really tight, you can't... The, that means that, oh, if you, want some, if you want to take the trash out, you need to pay some a certain rate. Or, yeah, the engineer at, the, at your start, tech startup needs to take the trash out. He fills up the trash can. Mm -hmm. Everyone's take a turn doing that. Like, if that's your goal, then just have a tight labor market, and you can create that through various methodologies and ways of amoral and moral ways. But like this whole mythologizing around, like, oh, if everyone has an, an experience of being a common worker, it's like it's it's silly. Like, sure, I I, like, I mean, like, I can buy into some of the even more moralized parts of that. There are definitely I, as somebody that worked in service, there are definitely some motherfuckers oh, that need to spend a year with a customer facing job, 100%. and they need to have their fucking attitudes one million percent checked. Also, I have a lot more respect at a job as a line level worker. This is one of the reasons why I like working at McDonald's over any other place I worked at. I have a lot of respect for bosses that can do my job. Like at McDonald's, if you fucked around or if you suck shit, like the supervisor would move you off your station, and he would work whatever job you were doing like 10 times faster than you and everybody on the floor had so much respect for those types of workers those types of bosses that could like step in and do a job so like i do see some value in it i just i feel like organizing an entire economic system around it is going a little bit too far agree but that's the point of that system that's mm -hmm. it's marketing and branding i don't see it as a moral uh uh 
framework as much as like um, yeah, uh, Destiny brought up in in the past the um, sucking dick for coconuts analogy. Wait, what? To, Did like, I? Wait, can you give me, can you refresh me on this analogy? Or, or, or maybe that's like an that analogy that that um, that uh, Vosh had used, but it's like um, uh, you know, if if you land on a deserted island and uh, there's two people, one person wakes up and collects all the coconuts and says, you know, suck me off if you want any of these coconuts, is that considered like a fair exchange? You know, and, and that's like mm -hmm. how capitalism can be like uh, co coercive that we, that's, you know, uh, uh, work or, or starve, you know? Yeah, when people um, like, so, um, when people like Charlie Kirk say in a capitalist society, you have a choice on whether or not you want to work. Well, how free is that choice really? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah okay. So the, the way, um, uh, Richard Wolf to like a, a much larger degree than like our current system and then Michael Albert I think just slightly more so it's like okay let's take all of these like different coercive elements and just turn them into uh, democracy to try and like smoothen out so like okay uh, you know a manager is an authority well instead we're going to have like a workers council okay having like some jobs are like more empowering like if you're working for a publishing company mm -hmm. and one person is answering emails they're going to have a lot more to say at the um, workers' council than the person who's been sweeping all day. Yeah, well, I understand that. Another part of coercion. So if we if we have them share in the sweeping and share in the answering emails, then when they go to that democratic council, they're going to, um, you know, the, the coercion. coercion yeah, is I, going I to understand be that. One one of the problems that I have with Michael Albert, and I don't, is that. I don't know how much I feel like your job should be the main source of joy and accomplishment and achievement from your life. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a job that you feel like okay with, but then you use the money that you earn from that job to pay for hobbies or other things that you actually get like a lot of fulfillment or joy out of. I don't know how realistic it is to design an entire economy where everybody is feeling so much fulfillment from their job that like that's almost all they need. And it felt a well, little... But like that was kind of what Albert was kind of like aiming for was it so that everybody gets some level of empowerment no matter what job they're working. And and, and this is kind of the the so unfortunately I know way too much about like the meta around the various Marxist theoretical schools of the 21st century. But that was the whole criticism of Albert. Like essentially he created Marxism. His his way his way to create a Marxist utopia was working within the finite system of capitalism and hoping that empathy and morality would be the way we create equality. But in that way like. It's not that we'd equalize power, we'd equalize this, this general sense of, like, just empathy for each other, which, like, is almost, like, Jesuit in how they analyze that kind of situation. Um, in my personal uh, uh, argument that I'd offer for, uh, for you, like, I think, unfortunately, we do have to live in that world where people need to find joy from their job because most people don't make enough money for hobbies. That's the reality. Like... The average yeah, person working uh, more hours Trump a day. bragging like about that. having super low unemployment when everyone's doing like gig economy bullshit to like oh, make and, it. And, and it's and it's not just that. Like eat, like I, I like I think Prop Twenty Two is important, but like still people are going to be working those jobs and working long hours, not not being paid very much. Like that's the issue. Mm -hmm. Like the reason that like the gig economy has a small appeal, to people is at least it gives them slightly more control over their over their lives in some way, even if just still economically they're fucked it's this fantasy of control and freedom like i i something I, I remember like recognizing but like i but like most people their friend group like we are of a generation where like our friend groups are the places we work like google and all these big tech companies they pitch themselves as social places to be when it's like if you if you look if you read any literature of like history and culture like no one was friends with people they worked with they had like weekends and free time and clubs and size they'd be the, part the of guilds, they had the, maybe. Time. Hmm? the guilds maybe okay well sure we're, we're talking modern history yeah okay we're talking like the past 50 years yeah yeah, yeah. Years. and like the whole bowling like the class everyone brings up bowling alone and it's not that like americans uniquely became more ap apolitical or apathetic or that like tv just made everyone super obsessed with politics or culture it's that just look americans have to work more hours every day or they have to travel by working more hours every day. That's the issue. And so you don't need Marxist utopia to solve that. You like you look at the map and you say, okay, reduce travel time. Okay, public transportation. Okay, work stuff. Okay, we mandate either higher wages or more work. We figure out the way to make that work. Like, working that way. But like, 
I think I, one I problem we've run them. into though is that like capitalism has to some extent become a guidance for our like moral principles and how we obtain happiness as well. So for instance, one sad thing that I see repeated often is that like, why do we go to school? We go to school so that we can get high paying jobs so that we can buy more products and goods and services that make us feel like we've accomplished more in life. Like, I think that we, I think that people, I'm a big fan of capitalism in terms of how it, um, in terms of how it distributes capital. I think it does it really well there, but I think people live their own personal lives sometimes by some like capitalist mindset. And most of these people aren't. <laughs> Like, if you don't own capitalists, yeah. you're not a capitalist. If you don't own capital, yeah. you're not a capitalist. Like, good job. Like, you make a lot of money, but like, what what have you gotten at the end of your life for all of that, right? Like, I think that we undervalue a lot of things that are a little bit less tangible, that are harder to um, uh, come by. Like, ha like maintaining healthy relationships, friendships, family, stuff like that. Yeah, because like the beauty of capitalism yeah. is it devalues all things that aren't capital focused. Yeah. Like, on one hand, yeah, it sucks that it's there that there's less time to go to church because you have a job. On the other hand. Most people go in the church, and you could divide that up for everything. Mom, what were you going to say? Um, when I was in my, yeah, when I was in my uh, master's um, program, the professor said, like, "Oh, I remember, you know, when I was teaching at this college, you know, whatever, two decades ago, three decades ago, and there was still, you know, people were still allowed to focus on their electives and stuff. And nowadays, it's so much like you're going to school as like a, a business investment in yourself rather than like development as a person." That people are taking like math classes as like their electives in college because they want to make themselves more marketable mm -hmm. like how miserable is that and then the, the arts and the stuff in the colleges are dying amen as a result commodify everything if you cannot sell it it's not valuable it's yeah which is kind of bad right i love it that's that's the part about, i love about capitalism that's you think the that's part good like. yes <laughs> why would you say that though because we have the freedom in the market. Like, my issue with capitalism, capitalism, if we're talking about the theories of like, are, are, is the inequality, like, it's inheritance. It's the, like, that's my issue. Like, I like the theory of competitiveness. I just don't want people to die from it. Yeah, but, like, I understand yeah, that, but the, the problem is. Has pushed, has, I'm glad the market has pushed out things like religion and spirituality and philosophy. Those things don't benefit, don't like. They absolutely benefit. They absolutely we do. live in a world with poverty still. Wait, hold on. Even when you say material benefit, fuck material benefits. Life is more sometimes than just material benefits. Things like religion had massive, like, mental benefits to people. It helped people organize friend groups. It gave you a sense of belonging. It gave you a community to do things with. It gave you an inner, uh, a reason to get out of the house every weekend to go see friends and family and members of your community. Uh, sometimes it gives you tasks to do. Like, you can have community fundraising drives for things. Like, I think that that sense of, like, community and structure, it's really hard to commodify that. But the scary thing about capitalism is we lose a lot of things that have have a lot of value but no price right we, like things can be very like friendships are very valuable but it's hard to put like a dollar figure on those and if you can't commodify it we have no value or we, we pretend that it has no value and i think that's incredibly destructive i think to most people's mindsets are you guys uh, are you guys familiar with uh, rsa animate on youtube they put out little like yes uh, yeah yeah they have like the little draw my yeah. life kind of things except about like yeah, other yeah, topics so they have um they have the one that's really popular the surprising truth about what motivates us Yes, I've seen it. it. Explains, right? That, that one's really great. It talks about like, you know, why is it that, you know, really, really smart people who are like doing coding as their job turn around and come home and like make mods for video games. Yeah, well, invest like, thousands of hours in like, these really other projects awesome. that they're not getting paid a dime for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, hell, that's like, to, to a certain extent, us as, you know, content creators or whatever, or at least the, the less successful one. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think most of the, the, the value, the, the joys of life come from non, you know, marketable things, going to the, going to the park, learning guitar, uh, learning how to code, learning how to make mods for like a game that you like or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that scares me, Doug, is that like, people like money is a means to an end. Like if I get money, I like money because it allows me to unlock things in my life that make me happy. But it feels like a lot of people view it as like an end goal in and of itself. That if you make a lot of money and you buy the right things that society tells you you ought to have, then that will like leave you feeling accomplished or fulfilled. But then you end up with a lot of these people that get to their mid late twenties or early thirties that feel like they're so empty and hollow and they have accomplished nothing and achieved nothing. Even if they've got like a decent job paying decent wages, they just don't feel like there's much in this world for them. 
Because like, well, at the end of the day, they never actually learn how to be happy or make themselves happy. And just buying shit will make you feel good for a whole like two days while you have the new thing. And then after that, like who the fuck cares about the brand new phone that they've gotten, you know, like three weeks after owning it? Like it's just another piece of shit thing you own. Yeah, they've done studies on that, right? That like if you spend, let's say like uh, $80 on, or like several hundred dollars on a new TV or new furniture for your house brings you like substantially less happiness than like spending that same amount of money divided over a bunch of time getting like coffee with friends or yeah, something. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I could believe that 100%, yeah. Um, I'm... cool. Well, I, I gotta get, uh, get scooting, but I appreciate you, uh, for having me on. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the radical reviewer, I guess, if you like, um, someone told you to go read like uh, the bread book or new jim crow or shock doctrine or something you could pop on my channel check it out if you want uh if i think of something else interesting that would be cool for us to talk about or, or whatever i'll make sure to to hit you up about it yeah have fun be careful okay all righty likewise